Thanks in part to support from the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation, we're spending six episodes on a special series on vaccines. Last week, we discussed the history of inoculation, specifically variolation, as a precursor for vaccination. The history of vaccination is the topic of this week's healthcare triage. Last week, we ended with the world's first vaccinations in the late 1700s, when cowpox material was used to induce smallpox immunity. After this, it was quite a while before any new vaccines appeared on the scenes. We saw the first laboratory-developed vaccine in 1879, when Louis Pasteur weakened cholera bacteria in the laboratory for use in an immunization. He accidentally discovered that this was possible when his assistant forgot to inject chickens with a fresh batch of bacteria before a holiday, injecting the chickens instead when he returned a month later. These chickens survived showing to only mild symptoms, and later proved to be immune to further infection. Pasteur figured out that the bacteria had been weakened by the prolonged oxygen exposure, thus creating a less deadly but still effective antigen. Other lab-based vaccine advancements followed, including the weakening of anthrax bacteria with carbolic acid, weakening of rabies virus via the drying of infected nervous system tissue from rabbits, weakening of diphtheria toxin and cholera bacteria by heat treatment, and weakening of a measles virus strain by passing it several times, like 40 to 80 times, through different cell types. These and other methods, including the use of formalin, a solution of formaldehyde, were experimented with to kill or weaken viruses, toxins, and bacteria in order to create safe and effective vaccines. In 1926, it was discovered that aluminum salts could help to increase the effectiveness of the diphtheria toxoid. We now call such substances adjuvants and make regular use of them. Might be good to stop here and explain the different types of vaccines. We'll start with live attenuated and inactivated vaccines. Live attenuated vaccines are made by weakening the disease-causing virus, meaning it contains live virus to induce immunity, but in a form that cannot cause serious illness. We should note that these types of vaccines could revert to the original disease-causing form, though this is only known to happen with the live oral polio vaccine, the polio shot, not a live virus. Inactivated viruses have been inactivated with heat or chemicals like formalin and are thus not alive and able to replicate. The response to these vaccines doesn't resemble natural infection in the way that live virus responses do, and they often require multiple doses and then boosters. Despite these limitations, inactivated viruses are sometimes necessary due to limitations of live vaccines, such as their storage temperature needs or the risk of live virus exposure in cases of a weakened immune system. There are also toxoid vaccines, which target the toxin produced by a disease-causing germ. Toxoid vaccines are used to vaccinate against diseases like diphtheria and tetanus. And lastly, there are also subunit and conjugate vaccines, which we'll get to in a bit. Production techniques have also undergone enormous changes over the years. It was discovered that viruses like rabies and polio that affect the nervous system could be cultivated in chick embryos, which help to avoid major side effects that result from cultivating a virus with nervous system tissue. A method was also developed to cultivate polio virus in monkey kidney cells and other viruses in dog and rabbit kidney cells and in duck embryos. These discoveries also helped to reduce our reliance on using live animals like monkeys for growing and testing viruses. However, researchers began shifting to the use of human cells around the 1960s, following the detection of simian virus in monkey kidney cells, which prompted some concerns, though later research found no relationship between the presence of that virus and vaccine complications. This does mean that many vaccines involve the use of cell lines derived from human fetal cells, which is a complex and controversial topic, one that would take an entire episode, if not series, all on its own. In 1948, the first combined vaccine became available in the United States. It combined the diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis vaccines. In 1952, Jonas Salk began the first human trials with the killed polio virus vaccine. The vaccine was licensed by the U.S. government when results were announced in 1955 with 80-90% to effectiveness against paralytic polio. 1981, we saw the first subunit viral vaccine for hepatitis B. Subunit vaccines include only the components of a pathogen that stimulate the immune system, as opposed to including the entire pathogen. 
These vaccines often require the use of those adjuvants I mentioned earlier since they aren't generally strong enough on their own. All HPV vaccines licensed in the U.S. are subunit vaccines, using a protein that self-assembles to form empty shells that resemble HPV virus-like proteins. And in 1986, a hepatitis B vaccine that did not use human serum became the first vaccine based on recombinant DNA technology, which describes the process of joining DNA molecules from two different species together. This sounds pretty Frankenstein and has thus sometimes been used to scare people, but it's actually pretty straightforward once you understand what the process actually entails and achieves. For this vaccine, the process involved altering yeast cells so that they produced the virus's antigen, the component of the virus that elicits an immune response, which in this case was a surface protein in the virus. This was done by using an enzyme to remove the surface protein and then insert the code for that protein into yeast cells so they could grow a bunch of it in order to manufacture the vaccines. It's an incredible feat of technology. It's also safe and effective. In 1987, a conjugate Hib vaccine, as opposed to pure polysaccharide vaccine, was licensed. Polysaccharides are long chains of sugar molecules that create an outer coating on the antigens of certain bacteria. Pure polysaccharide vaccines are able to induce antibodies against these, but aren't all that effective in children younger than two because their immature immune system struggles to recognize the coded antigens. These vaccines also lack a booster response upon repeated doses. These issues were resolved with the development of conjugate vaccines, which linked the polysaccharides to a carrier protein, an alteration that resulted in a stronger immune response, including a response in children. Though we should note that there are still pure polysaccharide vaccines available for a small group of diseases. We could go on and on for days about all the individual developments, advancements, trials, and people that have contributed to vaccines as we know them, but we've done our best to cover the larger steps as concisely as we could. And we should mention that vaccine innovation isn't a thing of the past. Work is still underway to create new and better vaccines. For now, we'd just like to stress what a modern miracle the vaccine is. The last cases of naturally occurring smallpox in the United States happened in Texas in 1949, and no cases of naturally occurring smallpox have been seen in the world since 1980. Wild polio virus is very nearly eradicated, and many diseases that used to wreak havoc on the human race have been brought to heel by vaccination. It's truly a shame the vaccines are sometimes villainized more than the horrible diseases they protect us from. Next week, in the third episode of this series, we'll talk about the landscape in which the vaccine thrives, the immune system. How does it work, and how does it respond to viruses and vaccines? And what's the deal with vaccines and herd immunity? These questions and more next week. We hope to see you there. Hey, if you enjoyed this episode, you should enjoy episode one in the series on the history of inoculation. You should also watch the playlist of the whole series. We'd also like if you like the video and subscribe to the channel down below so you don't miss anything. And also go on over to patreon.com slash healthcare triage where you can help support the show even during a global pandemic. We'd like to especially acknowledge our research associates, James Glasgow, Joe Sevitz, Josh Gister, and Michael Chin, and of course, our Surgeon Admiral Sam.